So today I'm looking at Majima car number 44, which is the Kula Vidala Sutta, translated as the shorter series of questions and answers. And the location is near Rajagaha, and the main people involved are Damadina, who's a bhikkhuni, and uh, Visaka, who's a lay, or described as a lay follower. So throughout the discourse of series of questions and answers, uh, Dhamma Dinner is providing the answers and Visaka is asking the questions. So it starts off with Visaka asking of Dhamma Dinner, what is called identity by the Blessed One? And Dhamma Dinner replies, the five aggregates affected by clinging are identity. That is the material form aggregate, the feeling aggregate, the perceptions aggregate, the formations aggregate, and the consciousness aggregate. Visaka then asks, what is called the origin of identity by the Blessed One? It is craving, Damodina replies, which brings renewal of being accompanied by delight and lust, delights in this and that, that is craving for sensual pleasures, craving for being, craving for non-being. And what is called cessation of identity by the Blessed One? It is the remainderless, remainderless fading away and ceasing, the giving up, relinquishing, letting go and rejecting of that same craving. And what is called the way leading to the cessation of identity, the Noble Eightfold Path, right view, right intent, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. Is that clinging the same as these five ag aggregates affected by clinging, or is the clinging something apart from the five aggregates affected by clinging? It is neither. It is just the desire and lust in regard to the five aggregates. That is the clinging. And how does identity view, or self-identification, come about? Damodina replies, An unskilled, untaught, ordinary person regards material form, or the body, as self. He regards feeling as self, perception as self, mental formation as self, consciousness as self. Then how does identity view not come to be? The reply is, a well-taught person, skilled in the Dhamma, does not regard the five aggregates as self. And what is the Noble Eightfold Path? It is right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness and right concentration. And is the Noble Eightfold Path conditioned or unconditioned? And by the words conditioned and unconditioned, I assume it means, does it have to be learnt or is it innate? And the reply is, the Noble Eightfold Path is conditioned, so it has to be learnt. Are the, five, are the three aggregates included by the Eightfold Path, or is the Eightfold Path included by the three aggregates? So the three aggregates uh, are virtue, concentration and wisdom. So it's virtue, sila. Concentration Samadhi and Wisdom Panya. And she explains the three aggregates are not included by the Eightfold Path, but the Eightfold Path is included by the three ag aggregates thus. Right speech, right action, right livelihood, um, they are included in the aggregate of virtue or sila. Right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration, these are included in the aggregate of concentration. Right view and right intention, these are included in the aggregate of wisdom. So what is concentration? Unification of the mind is concentration. The four foundations of mindfulness are the basis of concentration. And this is explained in the Satipatthana Sutta on Majjhimakaya number 10, the foundation of mindfulness. That is the contemplation of the body, the contemplation of feeling, the contemplation of the mind, and the contemplation of mind objects. The four right kinds of striving are the equipment of concentration. And those four right kinds of striving are restraint of the senses, 
abandonment of defilements, cultivation of enlightenment factors, and preservation of concentration. Or it's the right effort in the Eightfold Path. So the repetition, development, and cultivation of these states is the development of concentration, replies Dhammadina. And how many formations are there? Or Sankara. There are three formations. Bodily formation, verbal formation, and mental formation. Dhammadina continues, bodily formation is the in-breathing and out-breathing. Verbal formation is the applied thought and sustained thought. Mental formation are perception and feeling. This is then further explained by Dhammadina. In-breathing or out-breathing are bound up with the body, hence bodily formations. Applying thought, sustaining thought, leads on to speech, hence these are verbal formations. Perceptions and feelings are mental states bound up with the mind, hence they are mental formations. And how does the attainment of cessation of perception and feeling come to be? The response is, it is not a thing sought for, I shall attain the cessation of perception and feeling. Rather, the bhikkhu's mind has previously been developed in such a way that leads him to this state. The question goes, questioner goes on then, so when a bhikkhu is attaining the cessation of perception and feeling, which state ceases first? The bodily formation, the verbal formation, or the mental formation? Dhammadina replies, first the verbal formation ceases, then the bodily formation, and lastly the mental formation. And how does emergence from the attainment of cessation of perception and feeling come to be? The reply is, the bhikkhu's mind has previously been developed in such a way that it leads to this state. When emerging, in what order does, does he emerge? First, mental formation arises, then bodily formation, and lastly, verbal formation. And when he has emerged, how many kinds of contact touch him? She replies, three kinds of contact, voidness contact, signless contact and desireless contact. Now these are translated from voidness contact or emptiness, nirvana, a sunatta, a signless contact, i.e. no fixed characteristics, or animitta, and lastly the desireless contact, which is the absence of craving and desire. So in voidness contact, everything in life is empty, of absolute identity, because everything is interrelated and mutually dependent. Uh, so that described, or not self. The liberation from the limitations of form in the cycle of samsara. And it's experienced by different individuals in different ways, is another uh, comment on this. And Visaka continues, and what does his mind incline to? And Dhammadina replies, when he has emerged from the cessation of perception and feeling, his mind inclines to seclusion and detachment, or viveka. And how many kinds of feeling are there? There are three kinds, pleasant feeling, painful feeling, and neither pleasant nor painful feeling, or no, neutral feeling. And how would these be described? Well, whatever is felt bodily and mentally as pleasant and soothing is pleasant feeling. Whatever is felt bodily or mentally as painful and hurting is painful feeling. Whatever is felt bodily and mentally as neither soothing nor hurting is neither painful nor pleasant feeling. And Dhammadina continues, pleasant feeling is pleasant when it persists and painful when it changes. Painful feeling is painful when it persists, and pleasant when it changes. Neither pleasant nor painful feeling is pleasant when there is knowledge of it, and painful when there is no knowledge of it. And what are the underlying tendencies of these feelings, is the next question. And the reply is, the underlying tendency to lust underlies pleasant feeling. The underlying tendency to aversion underlies painful feeling. 
and the underlying tendency to ignorance underlies neither pleasant nor painful feelings. And does this apply in all cases, is the question. No, replied Damodina. So what should be abandoned? The reply is the underlying tendency to lust should be abandoned with regard to pleasant feeling. The underlying tendency to aversion should be abandoned with regard to painful feeling. And the underlying tendency to ignorance should be abandoned with regard to neither pleasant nor painful feeling. And the next question is, do these underlying tendencies have to be forcefully abandoned in all cases? No, replies Damodina. These underlying tendencies do not have to be abandoned in all cases. Secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought, with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. With that he abandons lust, and the underlying tendency to lust does not underlie that. Now, I take this to mean that the underlying tendencies, tendency does not have to be forcefully abandoned in this case. It is natu naturally falls away or disappears once the first jhana is entered. But um, So a, a bhikkhu also asks himself, when shall I enter upon and abide in that base that the no ones enter upon and abide in? <clears throat> and the answer is, in one who thus generates a longing for the supreme liberations, grief arises with that longing as condition. With that he abandons aversion, and the underlying tendency to aversion does not underlie that. And this I take to mean that, in aspiring for liberation, the tendency to aversion naturally disappears. And when a bhikkhu enters the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure, and has purity of mindfulness due to equanimity, he abandons ignorance and the underlying tendency to ignorance does not underlie that. That is the, uh, I interpret that to mean the fourth jhana leads to wisdom. This Saka then asks, so what is the counterpart of pleasant feeling? The reply is, painful feeling is the counterpart of pleasant feeling. And what is the counterpart of painful feeling? Or well, pleasant feeling is the counterpart of painful feeling. And what is the counterpart of neither pleasant nor painful feeling? Ignorance is the counterpart of neither pleasant nor painful feeling. And what is the counterpart of ignorance? True knowledge is the counterpart of ignorance. And what is the counterpart of true knowledge? Deliverance is the counterpart of true knowledge. And what is the counterpart of deliverance? Nibbana is the counterpart of deliverance. And what is the counterpart of deliverance of Nibbana? Uh, Damodina replies, you go too far with your questions. The holy life is grounded upon Nibbana, culminating in Nibbana, ends in Nibbana. If you wish for an answer, talk to Buddha, ask him for the meaning. So then Buddha, uh, Visaka pays homage to Damodina and goes to Buddha and relates all that he has been told by Damodina. Uh, the entire conversation. Buddha replies that Damodina has spoken well. She is very wise, has great wisdom, and that if he, Buddha, had been asked to explain these things, he, Buddha, would have said the same. So remember it. And that's the end of Majjhima number 44. Thanks for watching.